do one. All right, guys, welcome back to the Adam Clear Defense Podcast. Today on the show, I have Stephen Day. Um, I believe he is the assistant director Rector of coaching with Perform Motion. We had Kelly on the show about a little bit over a year ago. Um, and uh, Stephen, I've, I've heard uh, I've been listening to the, the podcast all the, all the time. Um, also, you know, his segments on parallel, parallel lifting now with, with Kelly. And uh, I think Stephen is one of the better coaches. And I think we'll have a lot to sort of learn uh, from, 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 from Stephen. But I wanted to mostly ask you just to start off. Um, how did you get started with uh, powerlifting and powerlifting coaching? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, oh, first of all, like, uh, I mean, getting into powerlifting in general, kind of, I fell into it, I suppose, as an athlete. Um, have a long history of sporting background. So uh, back home, um, obviously in England at the moment, but back home, I played a lot of rugby growing up, rugby league, um, which then moved me into after that obviously we got to a point where when I was like I guess middle-aged teenager going into my to my early 20s kind of I stopped growing while everyone else kept growing so it was like I got to this point where I, I was good at rugby league um but I was getting thrown around a lot um so after that uh, I moved from there I think I was like 17 maybe verging on being 18 I just stopped contact sport and went to touch football um which in that i made uh the national team for that so i made the australian team uh and then from there i actually moved into boxing for a couple of years uh did that after um the touch football during i was kind of running both together and then i went to you know i was going to put size on for boxing because i still had that same you know really skinny skinny and short right like i'm not tall um frame to put some more size on and i just needed a place to be able to to run when it was like storming and and stuff back home because it was just a bit a bit hard out there um so i went to the gym uh just to use the treadmill and lift some weights and then to put on some size and um i kind of ran into someone that was just like like you're strong you know, have, have you, have you seen this sport? And I was like, not, not really. Uh, and then, you know, I looked it up on Instagram and this was back when like, I think it was like Lane Norton heavy, stuff like that. Um, seeing them and like JP in Australia and of course, and everyone like that. And I was like having a look at it. And then I like looked at some, some records, I suppose. I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm quite all right at this. Like, I don't think I was, <laughs> I think I was even lifting to worse standard back then, but I was like, I could, I could be pretty good. Um, and then my dad actually was watching a, a rugby league match with my sister and her little brother was playing uh, and I wasn't there. And um, my sister's uncle was actually who was the ex president of um, APU before they disbanded or before they lost IPF affiliation this year or left the IPF. Um, it was my sister's uncle and he said to my dad like is he on drugs or anything like that my dad was like no like he, he wouldn't touch it and he was like we'll get him to come to this gym uh for a session and we'll you know we'll train so i went to that gym uh and this was with sean muir and he put me straight into a meet he was like okay you compete in 12 weeks i was like, like what I, I guess like just thrown in the deep end all right um did my first competition went nine from nine loved it so and i just haven't really looked back since um, through through boxing in the bin then and was just like all right let's let's go for it that was it and then um in terms of coaching it was I guess the way that a lot of people kind of fall into it like we have a big passion for the sport um or fitness in general right and I, you know I started helping people like I help roommates and you know people that I work with because I you know they, they would ask me a lot people ask you a lot when you go into the gym just like in conversation they're like what should I eat or like what should I do for my training and I was like all right, so I started helping people, and you know, I did it for free, help like roommates and just friends write their programs and stuff like that. And then because of that, you know, I was seeing success. Um, I kind of just like rolled with that for a while, and I was just like, you know, teaching myself and watching a lot, learning a lot constantly. Uh, and then I was seeing a lot of success, so I was like, okay, I could, I could, you know, potentially do this, right? Um, and I did it on the side while I was working a full time full time job uh, as a butcher, actually. Uh, and then I, I left that. This was a couple of years ago now. Um, just, you know, because I'm the type of person that I kind of prefer to be like back against the wall, like sink or swim kind of right. whatever. I was just like, all right, like 
I'm going to be stuck doing this job that I don't really enjoy. Like I don't get any fulfillment out of it. There's, you know, it pays the bills and it's like, I'm doing fine financially, but I'm not that happy. Uh, so I was just like, you know what? Like that's it. I walked in, I think it was straight after like a Christmas, which is the biggest period um, in that kind of job, like the, the retail kind of job, massive. I walked in the day after Christmas and handed in a four week notice, sort of resigned, like no plans. I was just like, I'm just going to pursue this as hard as I can. Um, and if I have all these extra hours, then if I can, you know, I've always been someone that's like, if I can put enough effort into something and enough work, then it's all going to work out. And if it doesn't, then I've got this to fall back on. Um, but I never thought it wasn't going to. And then, yeah, that was really it. I just, since that moment, I've been all in, uh, on coaching. Um, and during that period, I think there was like a six months period I was on my own and I'd known Kelly previously from, you know, competitions in Australia and stuff like that. We've had conversations and I noticed that, you know, she was opening the perfect motion gym in Brisbane. And then I just messaged her and said, do you, would you like to, you know, work together, have another coach on your team? And at that stage, it was just me being, becoming a coach on the team, you know, being a part of the team. Um, and then you know, that progressed obviously from there. Um, I guess Kelly seemed value in me and what I provided the team and what I brought to the team. And then we, um, or she, you know, offered me higher positions and then we, you know, we moved forward and eventually became a co-director uh, in the business with Kelly. I, I would like uh, asking coaches about that because I think that like um, the best, like a lot of times, you know, we do some more in, in, into this, but it sounds like, you know, you kind of just have had a, a passion for this and yeah you know something that really gave you a lot of fulfillment and um you know i, I like for myself like it's it's somewhat of a similar story um but like it kind of is like i want to have everybody feel kind of like how i feel after like hitting like a, a new personal best um yeah, yeah and like the whole like problem solving aspect of things um you know like i've had a tough year of training and i was kind of thinking like why am i still doing this because like it's just been like up and down with like injury or like you know something in my life happens i'm just just like why am i still here i'm like I like the problem solving aspect of things and I, and that's how I stay engaged um, with it. And I think that, you know, a lot of times people do kind of fall into, into that coaching because like I was very similar. Like I just was training. I was getting for our progress. People like, dude, like, how do I get, how do I get, how do I get like you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, this is what I do. Uh, I'm kind of psychotic though. So I don't know if this is the right choice <laughs> for, for, yeah. for you. And then, you know, I, I sucked initially and then I just kept getting better and better. So, um, you know, really, thank you, thank you for sharing that. I have never really heard that. I always like hearing like the most, like the origin stories. Um, but I wanted to dive into first things first. Um, sort of the topic of lifters that respond uh, worse or better to higher absolute intensities because I mean, you know, I'm sure we have some athletes who just eat up that higher intensity that seem to really respond well, and other people just seem to just always tank. So. What are some characteristics you've sort of seen in lifters that might respond better to um, a higher average intensity or absolute so loads? If we're talking about like responding better, I, I feel like it, it's just a lot of leverage based things, to be honest. Like there is also proficiency with a lift, but I have seen other people that, you know, they are proficient in a lift and they, they do move really well with on paper, really good leverages for a particular lift, but I've seen them fall off a cliff at the same time when we do push it a bit too hard. Um, but the ones that, you know, respond quite well to higher intensities quite frequently, um, it's, it can be tricky, right? Because we look at it on paper and we look at them moving well, like this is consistently slow, right? Like the way that things are moving, like if you've got someone that's responding well to, to higher intensities all the time, they're not someone that's, I, I've noticed, you know, they're not, they don't look explosive, Right. That's that's one of the biggest characteristics that I've noticed is they can they can handle these, you know, like eighty-eight to to a hundred percent, like all like up to that, you know, that range, but they, it's never really moving fast. Uh that's one of the biggest things that I do notice. And then it's like, okay, how do we, you know, put this in a position where we're gonna be able to generate, you know, some momentum because essentially what they can do is they can almost lift towards their max all the time, right? Or, or up towards that. And then if we pull it too far back, they take so long to get back there uh, or if there's not enough or something. And it can be hard at times, but it's it's also hard on the other end as well because, you know, obviously, ideally, everyone would just respond the same, but that doesn't happen, right? 
So I think the biggest thing that I look for is obviously like the way that someone, you know, moves the bar and what particular lift it is, because we can be, you know, for myself, for example, right? Like I, I need to, you know, I feel as though I need to, you know, have a, have a single in there on my squat all the time, uh, whether that be, and I like at least once a week. And then if I'm not also lifting heavy on a, on a secondary day or something like that earlier in the week or after wherever it's situated at any moment, I don't really perform well or the bar feels heavy. So those are the questions that we kind of ask, like, how does the, you know, how's the bar feel on your back, you know, particularly the squat, like, does it feel light? Does it feel heavy? The other part too is like, okay, if the, if the bar feels heavy, but you're still moving fine, is this something that's load related as well? Uh, Cause I've had that issue myself too, where it's been like, okay, um, I've been strong, right? Like before I, before nationals this year uh, in my squad in particular, like it didn't feel good leading up to it. I did squat 283 or something on the platform. I can't remember the exact number. It was around that. Um, but it didn't feel good. It did not feel good for weeks before that. Um, and that, I think, was just the case of me not doing enough squatting work uh, leading up to it. You know, Because I, I do particularly respond better when there's three times. But obviously... Um, you know, we had to go away from that because of, you know, an injury that I had and I just couldn't handle it as much at a time. So at the time, so it never felt good, but I was strong. So it's like, this isn't something that I feel like I need to communicate because mm. of myself, right? Like I obviously know, you know, there's a difference, but like when it, when it feels good um, and it moves good, like that's perfect. This is the perfect situation that we want it's perfect scenario we can't really ask for anything more but when it's like when it doesn't feel good but it moves good uh, for myself as an athlete i'm like that's okay i don't mind because you know what i'm chasing is you know a weight on the bar i don't necessarily care how it feels uh and then you know after after we say nationals obviously i tore my bicep in that competition so i've had to come back and obviously like we had to change things again um and that's when I went through a period where uh, my squat didn't didn't feel good and it wasn't strong. So obviously for me, like that was that was really frustrating. Um, did not enjoy that whatsoever. I was, this is and that got to a point where I was, you know, I left it for for a few weeks. Like I don't just be like, oh, this feels crap. I'm gonna uh, feels feels crap, and you know, I'm not strong. So I'm gonna mention this right away. I kind of like let it play out. Uh, before I say anything and then obviously like when it gets to you know the end of a block or something I had to communicate I was like look like I can put up with being I guess strong and it not feeling good like that's fine because I'm still strong but at the moment I'm not strong and it doesn't feel good and I think this just is a case of we're not able we ha we're not doing enough because we're still kind of in this realm of what worked before was okay because I felt right. strong but I didn't have to, I didn't have to pull all this volume and intensity out when I tore my bicep to then like when we came back to what was working before, didn't work again because of that, that lull period where, you know, there was 10 weeks or something where I didn't really have a barbell on my back or six weeks. So then when we introduced what was the two times, I suppose that was working before, didn't really work again. Yeah. What I've seen with, what I've seen with that is like usually when it feels like if you're strong, but it doesn't feel good. In my opinion, that's the kind of riding off of the momentum of previous blocks, not like what you're doing right now. And there's only like so much you can really sustain that for until like, yeah. you know, it's obviously going to fall flat. And usually you'll see re like regression once that does um, fall, fall flat. And so like when that happens, obviously, you know, for somebody that responds a little bit better to intensity, I'm assuming that you know, at least what I've seen is, you know, people, and need more top sets. You know, I view it as like a slightly like potentially like a shorter micro cycle on some lifts too, like so especially that bench press. Um, but usually, like you know, I'm going to get a little bit more heavier loading. And probably my, my threshold is like eighty percent plus. I would say mm -hmm. those higher absolute loads and do that a little bit more often. Um, I guess one of the questions I've had though is like, you can't do that on like everything, right? So like. I'm assuming like you would still program in relatively, you know, easier down sets that are a little bit easier to like re recover from is I feel like in my experience, most of the overload just comes from like 
the frequency of like that heavier exposure, like obviously you need some certain amount of volume for that specific adaptation. But in my experience, I've seen to be pretty broad with some lifters. Um, yeah. Where like you know they get it's very like you know a belt squat is very similar to like a squat as far as like, what they can get from like an overload. Um, in, in your experience, so what what have you seen? So like a like a multiple multiple different things, right? So for myself, it's like okay, I need to to lift something heavy. Um, you know, two to three days out, uh, and I feel quite mm -hmm. good. But it's also like, at what point do I cap this to not do too much to then bleed into that main day? Right. Um, which is that can be the tricky part, especially as an athlete sometimes, because uh, nine times out of ten, like I come into that to that day prior, and I feel quite good. So like I, I don't feel like it's leading me into that session. I feel quite good, and then um, the sometimes the primary can can suffer because of that or the the main session. So it's like okay, let's find this sweet spot, right? This 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 nice intensity that you respond really well, and it doesn't push you over, and you can keep like keep pushing the main day up uh, if that's the you know that the plan right there, so that we're not you know essentially going too hard on one day because then it could just like we're flipping right where you're responding better if you, if you keep pushing that day. And if we're looking at, you know, one day responding particularly well, we want to keep it that way just to, just so like variables stay the same. So for myself, it's been like that big thing as an athlete myself, I feel like it's, it's on me to kind of acknowledge where that is. So, and I know how I feel, right? So if I go, uh, if I give you, for example, like the way that it's laid out right now, like I'll do like a single two days before my, um, my main squat session. Um, and I haven't actually gone over any point where it's felt bad at the moment. Cause obviously this has just been a change that we've done after I uh, said like this, I'm not, I'm not enjoying this. Uh, and it does, it does feel really, really good now. So mm -hmm. there's that as well. Uh, and it's like, okay, where do I hold back on this single that I'm doing two days prior to the single that I want to do quite heavy on? So it's like, I think for me, I look at it in a way where I'm going to find a sweet spot that builds up that that primary day. So on the secondary. So it's like, and it, if anything, that secondary becomes more important than the primary day. Right. Yeah. Because it's like, I, okay, I, if I, you go. I, I think it comes down to like um uh, your anchor point as far as what you need on that secondary day. Um, yeah. Like one of the things I look at is like, sometimes it's like I'm either like a percentage uh, of like the, like a primary day goal that you might have depending on where you're at in a block that somebody might need to hit yeah, that's 90 percent of what you um hit on, on the primary day or what you're planning on and that's what you need to touch in order for it to feel good um other times it's it's really just an, an issue of like absolute load that they need to to, to hit um more or frequently and it's kind of tough to like figure out what that is what i've seen with more of the intensity responsive lifters is they need a certain it's more about that absolute load and less about the the percentage because like for somebody like me, um, I've tried doing like a heavier top set, like uh, you know, going into my primary data, maybe make that feel better. Um, it just makes my like my back hurt and I just don't feel strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I do a lot better if I have like a really big swing. Um, so I respond a little bit better to that lower and in intensity. Like, say if I have a um like a two forty squat, like I can do eights with like one eighty and feel fine. Like yeah. I, I don't need a, that's a pretty big swing. That's like, you know, 70, 75, 75%. But for a lot of times, you know, that's something that you, you can look at, but other times, like, you know, it is just like getting that at a certain percent. Yeah. Yeah. And getting it, getting it right. Um, I think it's also worth noting, like looking at bar speed and stuff as well on that, that secondary day. So if we're looking at the rate it's moving and then relative to the load and then what your, your goal is for the primary day, it's going to really assist in, okay. I'll just leave it there. That that moved about the pace that I want it to move at, and it's relatively heavy. So let's let's see how that feels. And it's called almost like a testing period, right? You wanna you wanna find it initially, and then you can just chill there. And then you know, like, okay, that's the pace. Like that's how it felt. You know, you got to should be leaving notes and stuff like that, and that'll lead me into that primary day. Uh, and then right. it's like when it's like, okay, you're gonna obviously like you'll mess it up at points too. You'll go over it. And you'll know that, okay, I'll, as long as you're aware enough to acknowledge that, to be like, on that day, I should have just stuck with this and not not maybe done that one more single or something like that, just taken that, like, like what was your planned last warm-up, not going up, and then just you would have performed well because, you know, we use that 
I guess you talk about like the anchor points, but we use the performance anchor point of the primary day to find that anchor point for the secondary day as well. So then you, you go, if it doesn't perform well, you know what you did, you look back, you see and be like, okay, there's a note there. I'm not going to go past that certain point on how it felt, how it moved and what the load was. And then, you know, you can essentially fix it in one week. Yeah, exactly. I think one of the things I've noticed too is it's kind of funny because once you get it right, there's not like a big difference with like how heavy it might feel um, like subjectively to, to the athlete. Um, if you're, you're actually getting that second injury today, stimulus right. Um, because like for myself, I, I can walk in and like, because I, I, you know, I, I, it could be like a mental thing too. Like I just, things still feel like just heavier to me, <laughs> like mm -hmm. so, so subject, subjectively and like on the primary, it kind of feels like better and sometimes. And I think that's what we want to usually have is the primary day should feel the absolute best because like in, in your sense, it's like, oh yeah, you know, things don't feel very good, but I'm still performing. Like I, in one way I can, I can understand where you're coming from and you're not wanting to touch that. But in another sense, it's like, what if we tinkered a little bit and got that a little bit better? But I can also understand, you know, going into a national, it's like, I don't really want to fuck with what's working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was, I didn't want to fuck with it. Like it's like, if I can squat above 280, like that's cool. Like I'm, I'm happy with that. Like that's enough. Um, so we won't, we won't fuck with it. Uh, I think we did just add like a little bit two days before because I was still like, man, like this does not feel good. <laughs> like at all. it felt a little bit better after we well, added that. It's it like you don't have, it's like you don't have enough like fatigue to taper off of. Essentially, it was like that's kind of what I think it comes down to. Sometimes it's like you, like, you perform probably perform better under higher amounts of of fatigue as more of an intensely responsive lifter whereas yeah. other lifters like that are not they need lower fatigue in, in general um but the interesting thing about what i found with lifters that respond better to lower average intensities is that they they need to have like a relatively close exposure to their primary day like even with like deadlift which for it to like feel strong because if, if yeah. you're having that such that light and stimulus it's like you kind of get to that point where like we go the whole like you know the, the recovery the adaptation curve is like you're it's not that big and like you just kind of like detrain by the time you go to your, your primary day because i had a period of time where i uh, changed like three times a week squat um with the third day being a belt squat but that was this is like before i realized i had to, I had to do that um i had my my primary day on monday and my secondary on wednesday and i felt really 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 recovered going into my, my monday but i just didn't feel strong yeah. i just felt i felt like crap in the hole i'm like i think i need more i think i just, just need to have like a more quad volume and I added just a couple of sets of the belt squat. I was like, oh, there, there, there we go. I also know I have respond well to twice a week squatting if I have like that, as long as I have that secondary squat day, like two days be, be, be before my primary day. And that seems to be like the, the sweet spot. That's also something I've noticed with like more of the, um, like also with like my, my, my bench. I do like a five by 10 the day before my, my, my primary with like 57%, <laughs> which is very yeah. un unconventional. But like, I like, I like, I, and always, always that day feels like crap. Because I have like three days of rest before, and then my primary day feels amazing. And that's one of the things I've noticed with more of the lifters that respond better to lower average intensities is that they need they need more of that that bolster bump, like, yeah. depending on how fast they like de 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 train. And I think from a certain sense too, it's like it's less specific technique practice, so like you don't retain that skill as, as long. Yeah, yeah, it's almost just like something, right? It's just something to to kind of I guess push them over without being too much because, you know, it, obviously if it gets too hard and, you know, you probably notice this as well, as soon as it gets too hard for someone that, you know, that really doesn't respond well to having higher intensities, it's just a massive drop off. Um, and it's like, but someone that can auto-regulate really well, like you'll notice that bounce back really fast too sometimes. So it's like, can be this, this like massive drop off and the, you know, the, the primary day or something just doesn't perform well. And then it's like, okay, we've got to auto-regulate, pull things right back um for like a week or less than a week or something just like the the first half maybe and then we can get this huge response but we've had to pull so far back that it's like that didn't really do anything besides let you recover right yeah no i think that it's i think that's always like an interesting conversation but you know really just come down to trial and error and seeing um yeah like it's, you know what the athlete moves like and how they you know they really, really respond to, to different things um I will say usually I'm going to probably not bias towards heavier intensity because I think that's less the case of lifters responding better to that higher like intensity. Um, and then usually it's like, you know, with that approach, like lower intensity, if they feel flat or whatever, you know, I might change the rate of exposure, have it a little bit closer to the primary. Then if that doesn't work, that's what I'm going to probably say, okay, maybe let's try some more intensity on the secondary yeah. day to see if that helps.
And then if I that doesn't like, work, then I'm like, we need more frequency. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if we're if we're going for like that higher intensity kind of exposure and you know, trying to progress someone that way, it can be a little bit more riskier uh, because it's like, okay, what happens then is potentially like another day starts feeling stronger than the day that we want to feel stronger. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, okay, we lose that sense of predictability within, you know, what we're riding because you go in one weekend because it's all kind of heavy, I suppose, or at this range, then it all starts to feel good for a bit before it all doesn't. So it's like, we need to, it just comes down to communication. And as you said, trial and error as well, because you need to be like, okay, this, this day we need want it around here. And instead of like potentially like an RP or something, we'll just prescribe the load and be like, okay, this is all I need you to hit. So I want you to go over that. Uh, Cause if you start going over that or a range or something and we want it to move at you know, this speed or, or, if someone's using a VBT, we could use that, or we just want it to, you know, move at this, your perceived RPE being this, um, and then that's fine. But it's when, you know, there, there's no real, I guess, change on it then, and then there's free range where it's just like, okay, this, this feels good. I'm just going to push it up. And then they come in, and like I said, like the, the primary day suffers because of how hard we push that other day. And then like changes the response and we do lose that predictability there because we have essentially changed where, you know, someone's responding and all the adaptations are kind of rolling into that day rather than where we wanted them originally. What are some things that you, you know, you mentioned in communication there that you look for with your, with your athletes? Like when you're saying like, Hey, like these are the things I like need me to know, to know like if we're heading in the right direction or not, are there some key pieces of feedback that you ask for? A, a big thing that I do like to ask is like, how did it feel? Because I know if we're talking about like, you know, ex- intensity responders or something like that, that we're not coming in, you know, over recovered from not doing enough is just how did it feel? Because if it felt good, then we're doing a good amount. If it feels heavy, we're either going one, like we've gone either way too far, like not enough, or we've gone, gone over that, that threshold there. So then it's like, okay, where can we pull from there? So the big thing is just like, how did it feel essentially? Like how did the weight feel on your back or in your hands? You know? Um, and then it's like, okay, can we, can we look back at that other day? And is there anything that you notice different there? Uh, and I think I think they're the two biggest things because if you start asking too much, you start like blurring the lines on where the feedback yeah. is, and it's like we start to get too much then, and we don't really, you know, we don't get a conclusive answer then. If we just ask the least amount of questions, I think is probably the best, and those two are the ones that I kind of lean on the most. Um, and then you know, there's can be other things as well. After that, if it's like if we get a you know a response that's like you know we can draw a conclusion from, then completely fine. But if not, then we might lean down like the road of externals and things like that. Like how was all these other things like sleep, nutrition, and all that leading up to it? Could that have played a role? And if that's not the case, then okay, we kind of just like move down down the list. Yeah, it's interesting because like uh, with some of my athletes, it's like pulling teeth to get anything from them. They're like, here's my deadlift. I'm like. Yeah, I, else, I, I find that really hard as well. Like, but like, I kind of. But then my coaches are like, "This is how everything felt. This is blah blah blah." I'm like, "This is amazing. Like, I love you." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta admit, like, as an athlete, I'm not the best at communicating, just because I'm just like, I go in, never gonna miss a session. I'll always get it done. Um, but in, it's not just like I, I just don't particularly like send as much stuff or something like that, and that's because it feels fine. Um, if I I don't like noise at the same time for myself as an athlete. Um, obviously, as a coach, I'm not like that. Like, I prefer to to know everything that's going on. But as an athlete, uh, you know, I don't like the noise coming in. Like, I'm just mm-hmm. like, here's this. Felt good. Um, it's fine. Leave it. Like, that's yeah, it. That's, 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 that's it. That, yeah, you're just the type of guy that you just go in and you just, just execute the session. Um, yeah. I, and I if, think it, if it goes that, bad, that's how I am. Yeah, and if it if it goes bad or poorly, um, I usually can come up with the conclusion myself. Like, if it does, then I obviously send that and say this is why it didn't go well. But when when it's good, it's good. It's just like it's good. Like <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm happy. It's good. If it's bad, I'll be like, it was bad. But upon reflecting, this is what I've drawn upon why it was bad. It's not. I. That's another hard one as well. When uh, we get obviously you know, athletes communicate with us, and it's just like this was shit. And it's just like, can you can you reflect on it a bit and tell me a bit more so I can help you because I can't without that. That's the interesting thing is I, I found that people that typically nail their externals like performance is pretty consistent. 
Um, yep. You know, it, it, and if somebody's having this really variable performance all the time, whenever I dig deeper, it's like, okay, like this is not consistent. Like, of course, like we're not like responding well. It's it's tough with those athletes. So that's actually a good, good, good question. Like what do you do with athletes to sort of create more predictability? Um, is I think it's fairly simple with people that, you know, like, you know, we're both online coaches. It's like, you know, we wake up, we, we, we tap on our computer to do yeah, the yeah, check-ins yeah. and go, go train. But people that are like, have like a rotating shift schedule or they have just crazy, just inconsistency. Like what do you do in that sense to sort of create some more predictability and training response? I guess like, because if we talk about like like routine jobs, right, where the, the job itself is predictable, it's kind of easier. Obviously, it's just like creating a routine, right? It's just like eat it. you're going to have your lunch break at this time, you'll eat at that time, you know, you'll train at this time every day. I think that's fine. That's easy enough to be able to create a routine. I think it's when we do get around those rotating rosters or split shifts or something like that, that it gets a bit, a bit harder or, you know, when someone works, you know, they work normal and then it's like, we never know when they're going to have like a 12 to 14 hour day. And that does happen quite frequently. That's when it gets hard. And I do think that comes down to communication as well. Like I, I have had people that I work with like that. And it's just been like, Hey, once it happens the first time, it's like, if this ever happens again, like obviously we can acknowledge now that performance wasn't good. Um, I can see that you're willing to train no matter what, like, and that's, that's wonderful. But if this happens, like I want you to kind of just forget about the days that we have kind of prescribed there and, you know, come in when you feel a little bit fresher so we can, you know, look at performance being a bit better because obviously it's not ideal. Um, you know, this is more particular when I work with people that do like the split shift, night shift and stuff like that. I'll be like, okay, it's, we kind of just lay it out like day one, day two, day three, day four, day five or something like that rather than, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That yeah. way it's just like, okay, if, if you're working, let's say you're working – nights on you know, sunday monday um i need i want you to sleep get your routine back with that because that's going to increase your performance before you just come in and train and we can still get all that work done in that that week period right uh, it's just like it doesn't need to be specific per day obviously we lose a bit of predictability there but it's better than having training performance down consistently because we're trying to adhere to something that's so strict within the days that they have to train yeah, I, I like that idea. One other thing I've done is um, I've had um, more of a like it's like accessory days and like so like like squat bench or deadlift days. Um, and I don't do like yeah. anything else with them. So like for example, like like hypertrophy is a little more it's less sensitive to that that mm -hmm. fatigue. Like if you're just trying hard, you're going to get some response. So maybe it's like you know I have like two bodybuilding days and then I have you know three days of like you know where you just come in just as you know squat bench and deadlift in some shape, shape or form and uh i'd say those are those are the ones you can kind of like what you said put around where you're more recovered because that's our priority as, as power of power lifters and then you know if you if you have the energy to go in and train you can still get like these accessory based days for the muscle growth but we need to make sure we're getting yeah. in this main movement and then it's, sometimes i will put in like you know like more of a, a comp or an accessory that i feel like drives their progress more um for that but lots of times those, those people just they, they can't like recover from from as much. I think that's one of the things that as coaches, um, you know, we have to really, really expand our our idea of what's possible. And lots of times with those lifters, like they may not be able to make as fast of progress because of their life variables. But yeah. that's a lot better than trying to force something and then just always getting her or overly fatigued. There's you know, you can't really force the adaptations. Like you just have to see if they happen and then make changes depending on what, what you can within the constraints of your lifestyle. Yeah, that's a big thing. It's just like like trying to to get it to work right, and just I think that's a, a really good conversation to have as well. Is is like like you said, these are your priority sessions, and these are a bit lower priority, which can be done when you probably are feeling a bit more tired or beat, and things haven't been you know in your favor lifestyle wise. Do them sessions first when you are feeling like that, but when you're feeling recovered, make time for them. They're more priority sessions, right, and be able to prioritize them. Uh, else, like people will just lose enjoyment, right? Because performance is just down all the time because, and they feel like there's no wiggle room. You know, they can't really work with their coach or something like that to be able to, to make it work. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's a hobby, right? And a lot of people get into it for fun. So if it's like, it just starts feeling like another job then if they if it is like that. And notice a lot of people do uh, lose that enjoyment. If it is too, too strict like that, um, and it's it's not hard for us as coaches to be able to come up with a solution to 
uh, I guess, fix it for them or, or assist them. Right. I, mean, so I think that lots of times, you know, we, we like, there's very much this idea of like, there is the, there is this one op optimal and, you know, lots of times that's because we look at like you know, the top, top athletes, people that are the strongest and what they do without realizing that, you know, they have certain lifestyles and they're different from you. Mm -hmm. um, some lifters are going to need a ton of volume and just need to spam it to just really get <laughs> a, lot, a lot of progress. Um, and then you have other, other people like myself who like, I can do like four to five foot squats a week and make fine progress. And I just fill in the gaps with my, my accessories. And um, I think that sometimes that when you, and this is kind of comes down a lot to, especially about training history of things working really, really well at like one, one point, And then like it stops working. It can be kind of like a, holy crap, like, am I washed? Like that's like, yeah, when yeah, I go, yeah. that, that that's what I go to is I'm like, well, this worked in the past. Certainly this like, you know, I must be like wash. Sometimes you just have to be really creative. That was just a conversation I had with like Sean about David Chan, where like he completely went to this non like specific approach and pulled back his frequency and his volume, and he's making the best progress he really ever has. And sometimes it's about doing the exact opposite of what you think might work. Um, because I think lots of times, you know, when you have the athlete, you're like they're not responding to anything I give them. It's like, well, you've exhausted everything in what you usually go go to. And you're not willing to go to something that doesn't seem like it would work. A really good example this is two of my lifters do once a week squatting, and the other day is a hack squat for their, their, their secondary day. And that was because they were dealing with lower back pain um, chronically in one of my, my lifters' case, and then one of them was constantly dealing with adduct with adductor injuries, just just constantly, constantly. And uh, we moved to that hack squat secondary day, and then they do three sets. Of squats per week and they're making great progress they're probably they're consistently pring and uh that's something i would never have thought and sometimes i think that injury can be a gift in some sense because it can help yeah. guide you towards something that you would never would have cons considered yeah yeah i completely agree with that um i for myself like i have found sometimes injury to be the best blessing sometimes because you know it's it's forced us to go down routes that we wouldn't usually go down um because, you know, it doesn't really fit, I guess, the biases that we created uh, towards the training program or the way that someone's responding, but we have to kind of veer away from it. And then had some of the best responses, you know, with athletes, with myself, with you know, multiple different people. Um, and as much as it sucks being injured, you know, we, if we can look at it in a positive light sometimes, um, because we can find that, you know, that new response that someone can work with in, then that's fantastic as well because then we can always we have what used to work as well um and as you said before like what do we what do we kind of go to when you know that's not working anymore and you know sometimes it can can just look on paper just not right right it doesn't doesn't even look like a powerlifting program anymore right. um and then it's like but we do know that at some point what someone was doing was working um i think there's always a for like okay let's go away from that we'll put that in the bank really and then we'll try something else and we'll, we'll keep you know chipping away at that and if that works really well we're making some fantastic progress keep running that almost until we get to a point where it's like okay this is like we're starting to get diminishing returns on that now but we still have that other program in the bank that mm -hmm. was working really yeah. well before and although you know it ended up getting to a point where it didn't really work that well um, we can go back there or work our way back there without going completely there. We can work our way back there from what we did have. I feel like that's like the emerging strategies framework, like <laughs> because they kind of find like two or three mac like um micro cycles, um and like programs, and they just kind of just like run them until they don't get until like you know they stop seeing progress on, on them. Um, yeah, I I do think though, like as you get to be more advanced, it's like. I can, you can't periodize things like as much like it becomes much more like a small um changes like block 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 maybe you change it like the top set and maybe maybe you like shift like one rep up and up and down on a secondary day um but other than that there's like not as much as you can you can really do as if you're a beginner it's like you can kind of do um whatever, whatever. one thing i forgot to mention too is i mentioned like with like um like people that respond better to like lower average intensity i think this is something where like you can look back if you maybe they like do like a more like a block periodize program right you have some people that in their volume blocks you're like on on fire 
Um, you kind of like, like look at that why. And one of the things I like about the block periodization approach sometimes with like more beginners that it kind of helps me find that faster as opposed to yeah. I was just not changing as much in a sense. Um, because like, we don't know like what, what works. We don't know, like, you know, if they kind of respond like, you, you, very similarly, there are some, some athletes like that. Um, but I, that's, that's a, a side tangent. I think that going over like, um, the gift of like injury and like things that like seemingly don't work, like, have you found that you really even have to like go back to something that was like working in, in the past though? Like if you've changed that much as a lifter and you, maybe you've gotten hurt and like you've gotten stronger too, especially like, because in my opinion, like things just change as you get stronger and people can't do as much. Yeah, definitely. Um, not particularly like exactly the same, but in terms of like how things were, um, yes. Uh, but not doing as much because obviously you get, you get stronger, right? So you're lifting more load throughout a session. So you don't particularly have to do like as much, I suppose. Um, but like for myself, uh, we've kind of had to work back in a way. It's obviously laid out differently now, um, but it's almost back to how it was before I got an initial injury now, um, which was the best I ever felt back then um, mm -hmm. by far. Like it was, I felt insane then like, I think it was like 2022 ish. Like I was on the verge of squatting 300. Wow. Yeah. So, th and that, like, that was really good back then. And that's the best I felt. Uh, and I still obviously have that in the back of my mind as well. That I like that feeling of just like constant momentum all the time just felt really, really good consistently. Um, that it's like, okay. Obviously, we're not going to go exactly what that was, but how do we make it in a way where I was kind of doing what I was doing, but with the biases that we have built over the last two years towards now? So I was like, okay, back then it was like I needed a higher rep set on like a secondary day, which then built me into like a middle kind of tertiary primer sort of day, which then I had my main day two days after that. Um, but then going back on what was working prior to, you know, nationals is I felt really good two days after my primary on my secondary there. So I was like, okay, if that day felt really good, it didn't matter what I lifted with the main day, I still felt fantastic two days after. So I was like, okay, there's, there's, you know, a data point there to know, like, I, I feel good two days after listing something heavy. So we, we shifted kind of the secondary to just be two days before the primary. And it can be heavy. So that's why, like, I worked to a single there. And then I had another single primary. So it's like, that's where I was going with, like, I, I can't go over a certain point, but now. Um, but I still had higher reps all the way back. So it's like, it's grabbing all these things from different periods of right. training. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. To fit it all together. So it's like, I have that from, from back, from just before nationals here now, because I knew that I felt better there. And then it's like, okay. But I had high reps back then and that worked really well. How do we fit that in? Although I'm responding to the to the higher intensity, lower reps on a on a primary day back then. So we put that in the secondary into the primary, and then the primary, I hit a single and then I back down to to lighter high rep stuff. Mm. So I was like, I've fit it all in now, and I still have that, you know, that tertiary primer day, but we've put it away from everything now. Like it's just there to keep me squatting, you know, with two or three days rest between each one. And at the moment, this is the best I've felt across all three squat days, probably like ever. And it's just like grabbing all these things from different points, uh, I suppose, in my career that were working at times and what felt good being able to acknowledge what felt good. Because I think when something feels shit, something also feels good. Just because a primary day feels shit, it probably feels shit because it feels shit relative to how good it feels on another yeah. day. So it's figuring out why that day feels good. Yeah, really, that was exactly what I was going to say. It was like grabbing pieces from like, you know, different things that, 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 that work. And then, you know, as you like progress things, like my, my friend Brandon and I kind of, or Brendan and I talk about like having that golden micro cycle that you like run for a brief period of, of time. That's made, and then you might go back to like a slightly like regressed version of it. Just so like, you know, you're still making progress, but like it's like less, um, extreme as far as volume and, and whatnot is just as listeners just need a mental pullback. Yeah. Um, but I really like that, that idea, just taking things. And I think that is really 
the benefit of working with a coach for a long amount of time too is that they kind of you know if you're a good coach you kind of you have been, you just have mental notes about about the lifter you remember little things about them and like why they were might have responded better it could be a little more objective with things as opposed to you just trying to go off your training data because like <laughs> You know, I, I'm a coach. Like, if I have a bad session, like, I have that Egypt reaction of, like, it's so over. I'm washed. It's done. Like, I'm never just gone <laughs> again. Um, you know, I know that that's, like, you know, not, not, not logical. Like, in the moment, I always feel like that. Like, well, I got to scrap everything and go back and having somebody there to say, well, this is probably why or, you know, this, this is expected or whatever. It's, it can help you out a lot mentally along that journey. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, yeah, I think, like, touching on the point of, like, well, why it can be so beneficial to have a coach – um, for a long term or, or ha- working with an athlete athlete for so long is is that like you have all that data there and you know I took all that and said to to Sean I was like this this is what worked and I kind of just like left it, it was like because obviously we, we had a conversation where it was like I was like do you want my input on what I think has felt good and I told him basically everything it was like okay now you, you put it on paper because I trust you and I don't want to be hands-on with my program it was just like this is what feels good for me um, and what has felt good throughout these periods. And then it's up to you to do it. <laughs> like, and, and then I'll follow it. You right. know, I'll go into the gym and I'll do it. Um, because that's, that's as far as I really want to go with like input. Like I tell him um, what felt good in the way that it felt good. And then, you know, other obviously minor suggestions like that. And then it's like, and I'll, you know, I'm obviously going to follow whatever is on a sheet. Um, but because we have all those points and we've worked together for so long now, it's very easy to to kind of know what's what's been good and how we can you know communicate like that and then have all those points and put it all together to what it is now, which is so different to what worked, but also very similar. Right. No, that, that and that's that, that's why I was saying like that's what like keeps me engaged because I'm like, well, maybe this block went better here. Like maybe bench felt really good. Okay, and we're going to keep that. And maybe the squat felt fine until this point, or like little things like like that. As far as you know, the, the programming aspect of things, I've also found that like the execution thing can sort of differ between you know, certain background to the higher intensity versus lower in, in, in intensity. Um, with like you know, just having big, bigger jumps on that last week of training with um the lower intensity lifters, like they just yeah, look a yeah, lot that's better. A huge one. And the uh, like, and that's what I found is kind of how I respond best. Um, I saw upon this randomly on like one of my blocks. I just kept the bench really, really light. So I'm like, this feels like shit. This also feels like shit. And I just kept adding like two and a half to five, five keys. Then on my last week, I'm like, holy crap, this feels really good. I did like one sixty seven and a half, and I was like, and I, I jumped from um one fifty five to one sixty seven and a half. This is a really big jump for like bench. Yeah. And then this last block, I did like uh two twenty seven and a half to like uh two forty five. A squat <laughs> and i was like that felt really good and then like deadlift sucked because i tried to like take two small jumps i'm like oh i just burned out too fast like and then sometimes people just need to have more of those smaller jumps like leading into that um into that last week um and just more or, or even not even smaller just like more 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 even jumps why i find like, people that respond better to that yeah. ranking and intensity yeah, I think that that's a whole another conversation as well as like the pacing of a of a block and like how different lifts can be paced differently as well based on how someone's responding. Uh, I have that with myself, like obviously bench, like I can start all right, like decently heavy, and it's like smaller even jumps uh, per week. Whereas deadlift, like if I if I start heavy at all, like I burn burn so hard like what you'll um, find is like it starts off slow and then it's just it gets slower and it gets slower and it's slower and then you just die yeah and it's like that's that's going back to like looking at you know the, all these data points that we have and you know i've gone back in I, I write everything down in like a book still um and i've gone and like open these books like this is my deadlift and when it felt really really good what did I do here? Because, you know, a block didn't finish really well. And I'll be like, what did I do here for it to feel too, so good? And it's like, I look at it. It's like, I fucking started that block 30 kilos lighter, but finished it 20 kilos heavier. I was like, all right, like there's the answer. Like I'm just starting a bit too heavy, even though I'm stronger. And obviously like baseline should go up with it. That first week for me has just got to be really easy. Else, you know, by the end of it, I'm just can't do enough in or i do too much ends up making me do too much in like the week two three or something like that rather than it's like i could probably do the same in week two but the thing is i've done too much in week one how i look at it is if you don't take enough off 
and it's, it's different for, for everyone. If you don't take it off enough, it's like that cumulative fatigue never drops enough. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really becomes the main, I mean, the main issue is I think that's that chronic fatigue is something that's, I think that is the main reason for like injuries happening too. You know, there's just too much of that chronic f- fatigue is, you know, also times with powerlifting injuries, it's very, very, sometimes it does happen. Like it's like all of a sudden, like this randomly happened, but like, usually it's like, well, you had a lot of high training stress or life stress and just yeah. your stress bucket, like there's just, just overflowed. And so sometimes just, you just need to have more of that, um, light, lighter week. And especially as you get, uh, stronger, like I was talking with like, um, like I posted this on my story and like, Starting at like RPE zero seemingly seems to be the, the the key for progress, especially as you get um, bigger and stronger with keeping you healthy and really. So, yeah, you can get you can always add m- more more weight. Like I don't, I think sometimes two people get in their head about, well, this is so much lighter. Like what I can do, I'm like, oh. and how I program, I don't really care about like relative to like the top end. I care about how can we set you up for that next week of of, of training, and then the next week, and then the next week, like most productively based off of like where we are at in the block and. I've seen people like, you know, start off with like just super light RPEs and that's just what they need to do. And it's, it's done nothing like nobody really cares too about how heavy you train for not, if you're not making that progress too. And you have to be kind of get no, that no. Through, through, through your head. Um, like the only person that trains seemingly heavy all the time is John Hack. And like that, that's the only person. Yeah. Yeah. I think like a, a big thing too is that it's like, yeah, you can, you can do that, but do you, do you need to right now? Like what's the point? You know what I mean? Like, uh yeah you could come in and you could you can lift really heavy right now but if that's going to cost you living lifting heavy in your competition in five weeks like what's the point you know or or if that costs how you lift at the end of the block like what's the point you know it's it's not worth it essentially it's like we don't have to do it it's like being able to to predict that time when we can express the most strength uh is essentially how we're going to to get stronger consistently right and not run into all these injuries or issues um and i do think now there's a lot of information out there you know provided to everyone so they can they can kind of work on that but it's like myself coming from like the the meathead era i guess like well it was hard to kind of detach from like pushing hard all the time you know with loads like didn't really matter what week it was it was like we can still lift kind of heavy. This was for, for a long time. It's a couple of years ago now, but it's like, we can still lift heavy, you know, quite consistently. Um, and we'll be fine. Like, and we get to this point where it's like, didn't really know what fatigue felt like for a while because I was just yeah. fatigued all the time. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's obviously changed now, but I think that's just based on like the time and like, obviously coaches are more experienced. Now we have a lot more knowledge. Um, you know, we know when to have that conversation of like, hey, you didn't need to do that or like how we can just constrain someone through their program uh, by not letting them do that if we see that that's the type of athlete that they are as well. Yeah, I think it's, I think sometimes like, you know, as a coach, you really have to put your foot down with, with, with athletes. But I also think like, yeah. you know, especially as they get more and more advanced, like you need to, I think, listening or considering what they're saying a little bit more like matters. Um, Like one of my, my clients, um, like he kind of tells me like this is what sounds like most fun to, fun 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 to me like right right now and like it might be different than what I was planning but like usually I let him, let him do it because like it works really 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 well um like for this, this last block um he hit a thirty five pound uh, PR on his squat and like we just did like two lighter blocks of like um a set of five and then one light singles block and then um he did like a heavier singles block where we you know had that really big big jump the last week of like it was literally like 60 pounds um, yeah. and it was sort of great. Um, but that's only because like he's had like over a decade of training experience. Yeah. I think that's a big thing too. When we get people that are more experienced is they, they know how they feel like in each session more than what we do. Like we're not actually doing it for them. So right. you know, when they come to us and they're like, oh, that may, may look, you know, completely different on paper. It may look like, you know, very constructive, like, when they, they say it, it's like we listen because, you know, should know. And, uh, you know, as athletes ourselves, that we know that we know how we feel best, right? We wouldn't say it if we didn't didn't know it, I suppose. So I think that's a b- big thing to come with, like, the communication, just being able to listen to an athlete. Well, when they say that, like, I, I have a guy exactly the same who's, like, he's squat, right? Like, he can squat um, 310, I think, or 300, but it's, like, he has to, like, sit a block or two at like not going over like four reds before we can really mm. express that or it's like it's got to be really really light 
um, or he can do it like oh like once. It's like he's someone that's that responds really well to to not high intensities. Like he can do that heavy squat once, and then it's just got to be his back downs. It's got to be like taking off over hundred kilos. Else, like if he just does too much, it just doesn't work. And he came to me with that. It wasn't me, you know, saying to him like you got to do this because obviously like. The way that it looks on paper is a bit different. So it's like we kind of got to prescribe those back down stuffs because it is so light. But he came to me, he's like, can I try this? Because I think this is the way that I think I'm going to respond really well. And that's how I feel good session to session rather than just like feeling good for one session, capitalizing on all of it and just like, you know, ex expressing everything he's got and then dying for two weeks before he can come back. He's like, if I do it like this, I feel like I can just like compound all this momentum and just keep moving better. With so with lifter like that, then that has to go lighter. Um, do you usually give them like say like more of a uh like a block approach for they're doing like you know higher rep um block and as far as like the, their their top set, and then you slowly like lower down the reps as they kind of yeah. feel better. Yeah, yeah. I, I've done it like that. I've done it where it's just kind of just been you know static, but we keep it light. Like things don't change too much, but we just make sure that it is light, and we we'll take like an approach of like, okay, he can, he can have one hard set, like a block or like every two weeks and we'll take it there. And it's only one set. We'll take it there. And then other than that, it's got to be easy. And like that comes from communication as well, like back and forth him, him letting me know obviously how he feels. And then me saying like giving him the go ahead really of what we're going to do. Um, but yeah, it's looks quite unconventional on paper, um, but it works. So it's like, run it yeah if that's what matters the most it doesn't really matter how it looks all that matters is the response so steven i really want to thank you for for coming on this is a lot of fun to just kind of geek out a little bit over these programming topics um if people want to find you or hire you for coaching where should they head uh i'm on the performation website i'll just look up for coaching inquiries and obviously on instagram is steven day underscore performation Cool. Well, I'll make sure I include all that in the show notes. And thank you guys for listening to this, this episode. I'll talk to you guys in the next one.